this is week four of our series in Acts, How God Builds His Church. And we're going to be looking in a few moments at Acts chapter 10. Uh, and I'll be reading from NLP, and you can look at your devices or your Bible. But before we get there, I have a question for you. Some of you who are in high school, maybe now you can answer. But those of you when you were in high school, do you remember it? Uh, did you have school spirit? Like, did you have a lot of school pride? I remember in high school, it was kind of this weird dynamic because, and maybe you felt this too, but I went to this strict Christian school that had these rigid rules, and so we complained a lot about our school. In fact, we just, we hated our school. But then there's this interesting switch that would be flipped when there was a sporting event. We complained about our school, but then at the soccer game or the basketball game or the volleyball game, then we were proud of our school, and we would cheer, and we would shout, and we would chant, and we would heckle the refs, and we would boo the other team, and it was just this really passionate, energetic affair, and uh, we had these schools that we hated, too, you know? And it often wasn't the schools that we beat. It wasn't the schools we pummeled, you know, pummeled that we uh, had rivalries with. It was the schools that sometimes beat us. You know, the schools that were maybe even uh, better than us. But we can never really cope with that. You know, like, it's hard to admit that maybe they have a really good coach or they have really just athletic athletes who work really hard. No, no, we can't accept that. It has to be that they're paying off their reps, is what we would say. They're paying the reps. And then the good players, again, we can't admit that they're actually just a solid athlete. No, he takes cheap shots. And pays the refs. If it was a fair game, right? Like if it was refereed fairly, we would have won. Have any of you ever been part of this whole experience? Uh, It's so interesting. As I look back at it, it seems so trivial now. I don't care about how the TCM Eagles, we were the Eagles, you know, Christian school, rise up on wings like eagles, that scripture, you know. It's like every... Other school, Christian school, had eagles as the mascot. We are te- I don't know what they're doing or how their sports teams have been doing. And honestly, I don't care anymore. But isn't it interesting? We, we get in the, this so much. It's just amazing how much emotional energy at one season of my life I put into not just cheering for my team, but disliking other teams, you know? We all tend to do this, though. We're all part of different Teams, whether it's your sports teams that you passionately cheer for, or it's your political parties, or even some of our religious affiliations or things that we're connected to, we all have this, we all have teams that we're a part of. This tendency for humans to sort of form groups, it's sort of a universal uh, tendency. And groups are formed often, usually around something that they have in common, usually around some sort of social, economic, or uh, cultural, or nationalistic, some sort, something that brings people together. They form a group around that. Sometimes it's around interests or experiences, and, and groups will form, and it happens everywhere all around the world. For example, one group that I am kind of a part of is I ride a motorcycle. So I have this shared experience of feeling the wind push against your body and seeing the road pass by beneath your feet at high speeds, this weird combination of danger and freedom, you know, adrenaline and peace. And so all of us that have that shared experience, we have a signal for one another. Maybe you've seen it. It's the wave. So you're riding by and another motorcyclist is coming, you throw your hand down like this. It could be a one finger point, two fingers, and just throw your hand up. It's the wave. Motorcyclists have the wave. It signals we're part of the group. You are part of group two. Some of you, some of you are part of the group of Notre Dame fans, perhaps. Some of you are part of uh, groups, maybe you experience this in the community with some of your coworkers. There's sort of a group of you, and it's not official, but you congregate in, you know, at break time, and you talk about the topics that you want to talk about. So you kind of have this sense of community, or maybe there's a sense of community uh, with people who share your political uh, perspectives, or maybe your neighborhood. Maybe there's a sense of community where you live. Uh, some of you are part of groups. Um, with, with uh, maybe certain movies or TV shows. Like there are people that you all watch the same TV show or you're all fans of the same movie franchise, you know, like Top Gun or something, and there's like this group of you or the Marvel comics. We all have these groups that we are part of. 
And inclusion in these groups usually involves some degree of loyalty and conformity to what's called group norms. Group norms are these things that are just sort of expected to abide by. So the wave, that is a group norm of motorcyclists. Uh, A strange group norm uh, for a certain sports team is that if you are a Green Bay Packers fan, you wear cheese on your head. That is a group norm. In college, I was part of a dorm that a group norm for them was for the guys in the dorm to put on kilts, paint their faces blue like the Scots from Braveheart, and go out to the soccer field and yell at the other team. They were called the Hudson Scotsmen. I'd actually never participated in it, but I lived in the dorm. That was a group norm. Now, group identification, it creates a sense of identity and belonging. And this is normal, and there's nothing wrong with it. But this tendency becomes dangerous when we begin to see outsiders, people who are not part of the group, as enemies. Uh, I once knew a guy who owned a scooter, and uh, he called it a motorcycle. It was a moped. And he wanted to connect with me, and so he told me he had a motorcycle. And I was horribly disappointed when I found out it was not a motorcycle, it was a scooter. And I thought, I didn't say it to this person, but I thought to myself, my friend, you do not have a motorcycle. You have a moped. You have a scooter. And then another time, I was actually on the road, and I was riding my motorcycle, and someone on a scooter tried to do the wave. And in my human sinfulness, <laughs> this is true, actually. I'm not making this up. I didn't wave at him. I said, you are not riding a motorcycle. I am not doing the motorcycle wave to you. You are not in the group. You are an outsider. And this seems... Uh, innocent enough, but it, it can become malicious really fast. You see, when people who are part of the out group aren't just outsiders, but when, when we begin to view them as less than, it becomes easy to dehumanize them, to not see the common humanity. And when we begin to see people as, as less than human, when we are not able to see our common humanity and the dignity that they have, Humans become capable of some really horrific things. The Holocaust stands in history as a premier example of what this looks like when it's carried out to the most horrendous uh, end. Renee Brown, in her book, Braving the Wilderness, writes about dehumanizing. She says, dehumanizing often starts with creating an enemy image. As we take sides, lose trust, and get angrier and angrier, we not only solidify an idea of our enemy, but we also start to lose our ability to listen, communicate, and practice even a modicum of empathy. Once we see people on the other side of a conflict as morally inferior and even dangerous, the conflicts are being framed as good versus evil. She quotes another psychologist, says, Maisie writes, once the parties have framed the conflict in this way, good versus evil, their positions become more rigid. In some cases, zero-sum thinking, you know, all or nothing, thinking develops as parties come to believe that they must either secure their own victory or face defeat. New goals to punish or destroy the opponent arise, and in some cases, more militant leadership comes into power. End of quote there, but then Brene goes on, says, dehumanization has fueled innumerable acts of violence, human rights violations, war crimes, and genocides. It makes slavery, torture, and human trafficking possible. Dehumanizing others is the process by which we become accepting of violations against human nature, the human spirit, and for many of us, violations against the central tenets of our faith. When we begin to see people as less than human, we begin to justify treating them as less than human. And so when you combine this us versus them thinking mentality with hateful or violent group norms, like let's say the KKK would be an example of this, this this hateful us versus them combined with a group norm of violence, things get ugly really, really fast. 
when the group identity is defined by who's in and who's out, and the group norms are centered on that, on the divide, it creates a term that's called tribalism. Uh, this sense of, of not, just, not just being part of my tribe, but defending my tribe against all the other enemy tribes. And this us versus them mentality, it's sort of a hallmark of a group identity that is starting to veer towards a tribalistic mentality. And it's very dangerous. So, these us versus them, these group identities, that if they focus on the outsiders being enemies, and they have these group norms that are acceptable, they become sort of tribalistic. And these tribalistic us versus them way of thinking create prejudices and uh, and biases. And the thing is, though, is your prejudices and biases are affirmed by the group and even awarded. So an example of this, though, would be, let's say I have the bias that Harley-Davidson motorcycles are better than Honda or Triumph motorcycles. The thing about this bias is it's completely subjective. But if I hang out with other Harley-Davidson owners, they are simply just going to confirm and affirm and even award and celebrate that bias. And again, that's somewhat innocent, unless I think people who own a Honda is less than, that they're inferior, that I'm better than them. It begins to create something ugly in the human soul. But the thing is, is group identities don't always have to create these toxic, tribalistic ways of thinking. If the group identity, if what, what brings the group together transcends the divide, and if it's if the group norms are good and kind and gracious and compassionate, where it's like normal for us to treat outsiders with kindness, then groups can be a really powerful thing to be a part of. We are part of a group called the church. And so as Jesus followers, we're called to be a people, a priesthood of believers, a community that is defined by the person of Jesus, meaning our connection to Jesus transcends all other differences. Paul will later say this. We're going to look at it in a few moments that there's neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, but all are in Christ. Our connection to Christ transcends our differences. And then the way of Jesus. So, so our connection transcends differences. But then we follow Jesus, the way of Jesus, of loving God and loving people, of loving our enemy and doing good to those who would hurt us and praying for those who persecute us. It directly confronts those toxic, tribalistic ways of being in a group. We are called to, to love other people in the way Jesus did, to be radically committed, radically committed to the idea that humans are created in the image of a God who loves them and gave himself up for them. So, this series acts when how God builds his church. I believe one of the ways that God builds his church is he begins tearing down the barriers and what Paul will say, the dividing walls of hostility that exist between us. When God builds his church, he will break down the barriers that exist between different groups. And we're going to look at that. In Acts chapter 10, God takes Peter on a journey to confront his own biases. And so if you have Bibles, we're going to dive into Acts chapter 10. I'm going to read the whole chapter, or if you have devices, you can look at it there, or you can listen. I'm going to read all of Acts chapter 10, and it's a bit of a long story, but I'm going to try to make it exciting, and I'll read fast. Acts chapter 10, we will begin in verse 1. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner, who lives near the sea shore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them that what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. 
prey. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He had a vision. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared. I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, These men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his house, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up, I am a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, You know it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for now tell me why you sent me. Cornelius then tells him about the dream he had, and the angel and everything. He simply just rehearses what he, what he said. He said, so I sent for you, verse 33, at once, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here waiting for God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. He tells them that you know what has happened in Judea. You've heard about John the Baptist. You've heard about this rabbi. Uh, Cornelius would have been familiar with, with Jesus and John the Baptist's ministries. He may not have met him, but he probably heard about it. Verse 39, We apostles are witnesses of all he did through Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, Can anyone object to their being baptized? Now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, so he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. I'm going to read uh, first verse of 11. Soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. But Peter arrived back in Jerusalem. When Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. Ooh, did you stay with me? Or did I lose you? Did we lose some people along the way? It's okay, I'm going to tell you what happened. I read it, and I'm going to tell you about it. So there were, uh, there were two Caesareas in the region of Judea. There was one known as Caesarea Philippi. It was north of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Peter made the bold declaration that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus made the comment, on you, Peter, on this declaration, I will build my church. And you will be called, uh, it's when he changes his name from Simon to Peter, you will be called Peter, which means rock. He gives him the nickname Rocky. Then there's another place called uh, Caesarea Maritima. Caesarea Maritima was along the, the uh, west side of of Judea on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. There was this beautiful seaport there. Herod had built just beautiful buildings there, and Caesarea Maritima was where Rome chose to make the capital of that region. 
the Jews, their capital was Jerusalem. Rome said, no, we're going to make it Caesarea Maritima. And the governors and Roman officials, they stayed. It was essentially, you know, beachside uh, property, beachside real estate. And so Cornelius, we're told, is a Roman officer. He's a centurion, and he's stationed at Caesarea Maritima. We're told Cornelius uh, was a God-fearing man. We're told he's devout, and we're told he's generous. He's God-fearing, meaning he worships Yahweh, but he's not converted fully to Judaism. So he hasn't adopted some of the Old Testament laws and practices. He hasn't fully converted, but he recognizes Yahweh as God. One day, at 3 in the afternoon, to be exact, Luke feels that it's important to tell us that, one day at 3 in the afternoon, he's praying, and he has this vision of an angel. This angel comes to him and says, hey, send for this guy named Simon Peter. He's in Joppa staying at a man named Simon's house, and he's a tanner. Very specific details, and it's interesting, though. Uh, it's interesting that Peter is staying at Simon the Tanner's house. Uh, tanners, they, their occupation was they tanned animal hides and made leather. And so by nature of their occupation, they were ceremonially and ritually unclean all of the time because the law said if you come into contact with dead carcasses, you are unclean. And so Simon the Tanner is constantly interacting with dead animal carcasses, so he's ceremonially unclean all of the time. And so the fact that Peter is staying and receiving hospitality from him, it would seem what some people would say is perhaps Peter is already beginning to compromise his Jewish convictions by staying there. And I also want to point out something else. Right here at this point, this angel comes to Cornelius. It's interesting. If the point was only to communicate the good news to Cornelius, could not this angel who told him where to find Peter with great detail, have just shared the gospel with Cornelius. If that was the only point, I think the angel could have. I think there's more going on here than just Cornelius hearing the message. I think God wants to take Peter on a journey. That, that what God is intending to do in Peter's life is just as important as what he's intending to do in Cornelius' life. The other thing I want to point out is that Peter is staying in Joppa. Have you ever heard of Joppa before? Are you familiar with an Old Testament prophet by the name of Jonah? He's the one who got swallowed by the big fish. Jonah was this Old Testament prophet who God called him to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Syrian Empire. Nineveh, at different points in history, was one of the largest cities in the known world. And Assyria, the Syrian Empire, was this military superpower, and they were known for their brutality, and they were Israel's enemies. The Israelites hated the Assyrians. And the Syrians would eventually conquer the northern kingdom of Israel a few decades after we believe Jonah uh, received this message. So Jonah receives this message to go preach. God tells him to go preach a message of repentance to Nineveh. And Jonah doesn't want to. And the reason Jonah doesn't want to is because he hates the Assyrians. Because Jonah knows, he says this later in chapter 4, that God is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger. So he knows if he goes and preaches a message of repentance and they repent, God is going to be merciful and gracious. And he just doesn't think those people are deserving of God's grace and mercy. And so he goes to Joppa. And he gets on a boat in Joppa at the, the seaport there. And he heads for Tarshish, except this crazy storm comes up and all the crew members, they think the gods must be angry. They find out Jonah's running from Yahweh, and so they throw him overboard, this big fish. It's a fish, not a whale. Just, you know, the Bible nerds will appreciate it if you don't call it a whale, because the scripture doesn't call it a whale. It calls it a fish. This big fish follows him, and while he's in the belly of the fish, he repents, and then the fish vomits him up. And, and some uh, suggest that this is metaphorical of how God feels about his racism about his, his animosity towards the Ninevites, that it just bleh, just vomits him on land, and he goes to Nineveh, preaches a message, they repent, God holds back his, his judgment, and then Jonah gets really angry about it. And he says, I knew you were gracious and compassionate and slow to anger. I knew you would forgive them. And he just could not stand. And the way Jonah ends, the book of Jonah ends with this verse. Jonah 4.11 reads, But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people. This is God speaking to Jonah. Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Kind of interesting. God even knows about the animals. Not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great 
city. And that's how the book of Jonah ends. Well, Peter is in Joppa, the same Joppa that Jonah hopped on the boat to run from God's calling. And Peter is now going to be faced with a similar decision that Jonah was faced with. It's the next day after Cornelius' vision, and it's lunchtime, and Peter is hungry, but he goes up on the roof while the food's being made. Perhaps the smell of the food being cooked influenced the vision. I don't know, his senses were in tune. And, and he sees this vision of a sheet coming down, and there's all these animals on it, except they're unclean animals, they're non-kosher animals. The voice says, kill and eat. Peter says, no, I've never, my whole Jewish, his whole Jewish life, entire life, he's never eaten anything unclean. He can't, he just, he can't comprehend it. God says, do not call anything unclean that I have made clean. This happens three times. And then the vision ends and Peter is puzzling about it. And no doubt Peter's memory, it goes back maybe by the Sea of Galilee. And, and he remembers those years he spent following Rabbi Jesus and listening to his teachings. He remembers one time Jesus said, Who doesn't go into your heart but only passes through your stomach and then goes into the sewer? It is what comes from inside that defiles you. So from within, out of a person's heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defiles you. Peter remembers Jesus saying, it's not the food you eat, but what comes out of your heart. And as he's puzzling and, and reflecting on this vision, the men, the, the three men, that vision happened three times. Three men come to the door and they're looking for Peter. And the spirit prompts Peter, go ahead. It's okay. I've sent them. You're going to go with them. So then tell them that Cornelius, a Roman centurion, sent us. For Peter's entire life, he's lived under the occupation of Rome. He was born when Israel was under the, the dominion of this Roman Empire, for his entire life, Rome was the enemy. And this Roman soldier has sent for him. Cornelius represents, not only is he a Gentile, but he is a Roman officer. He, he works in service of the empire. He is the reason their nation has gone through all of the hardship. He is the reason their nation is oppressed. Cornelius represents everything Peter was raised to despise. Sure, Cornelius is a God-fearing man, but he's still a Roman soldier. But Peter obeys. He doesn't go the route of Jonah. Instead, he obeys the Spirit. He invites the men in to stay for the night, and the next day they head to Caesarea Maritima. But when he gets to Cornelius' house, he hesitates. You see, to go under the roof of this Gentile, to enter into his house, would look like compromise. In Israel, in their history, the last time they compromised, God brought judgment on them and they were exiled. And so faithful Jews since the exile have been committed to not compromising. They will not even associate. They, they want to be set apart, so they don't even want to associate themselves with Gentiles. So to enter into Cornelius' house would look like compromise, but Peter risked doing the unthinkable. It's often when we do the unthinkable that God will do the unimaginable. He risked it, and he enters into Cornelius' house, and then, I think this is almost funny, he goes into Cornelius' house, and he finds that it's infested with Gentiles, because Cornelius invited his family and all his friends, so they're just swarming this house. He enters into the house, and they're everywhere. And Cornelius attempts to to worship him, and he says, get up, stand up. Listen to what he says. I am just a human like you. I'm merely a human like you. Why did you send for me? Cornelius tells him about the dream, and Peter begins to tell him about resurrection hope that is found in Messiah Jesus. And while he's telling about the the Holy Spirit is poured out, and, and there are other believers that came with Peter, and they, they don't know what to do with this, and so they say, I guess, I guess we need to baptize them. God's doing in them what he did in us, and it seems God is up to something here. And so they get baptized, and Peter stays with them for a couple of days, but notice when he goes back, this will often happen 
when you dissent from the group, the group will try to, to punish you and bring you back into submission. He goes back and when he's in Jerusalem, the other Jewish believers, it says they criticized him because he went into the house of a Gentile and he ate with them. What they forget is that it's their Jesus who is also criticized for eating and going into the homes of tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. Thankfully, most of the Jewish believers, when they hear the testimony later in chapter 11, when they hear the testimony of what God has done, they celebrate and they embrace the Gentile believers. But it is my conviction that God builds his church by breaking down the walls that would divide us, the barriers, the dividing walls of hostility between us, that God builds his church by breaking our biases down, by breaking down our division. Paul would also come to have this conviction. I want you to hear, I know I've read a lot of scripture, but I want you to hear what Paul writes in Ephesians 2. And, and I hope that as you hear it, you hear the theme, you hear this backstory, the context. He says, Paul writes to the Ephesian believers, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Notice that the part of what Jesus did on the cross, Paul is saying, is not just, not just purchase your forgiveness so you go to heaven, but whatever he did on the cross, it also broke down the wall of hostility that separated Jew and Gentile. He did this by ending the system of the law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near now all of us can come to the Father. All of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done to us. Paul would later write to the Galatians, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And again to the Colossians, he would write, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. All of our social, economic, ethnic, cultural, all these things that we categorize and divide it, it, under Christ, they no longer define us. They will so what? How, how do we, okay, how do we, how do we put, how do we make sense of this? I want to share with you three things that I believe happens in the kingdom when God builds his church. So I want to sort of summarize so we can try to say where do we go from here? How do we allow what God did in Peter's heart to be done in ours. How do we go the way of Peter and not the way of Jonah? Number one, I believe, the kingdom of God affirms the intrinsic worth of all people. The kingdom of God affirms the intrinsic worth of all people. So in the kingdom of God, the value of a person is not defined by their religious beliefs, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, cultural background, sexual orientation, political convictions, national allegiances, intellectual capacity, or moral convictions. Their value, it's not that those things don't matter, but the value of a person is not defined by those. The value of a person is rooted in the image of God that is imprinted on their soul, and the value of a person has been determined by the blood of the divine. Their value is that Jesus saw them worth dying for. So they are worth his blood. The value of a person is rooted in the image of God. So around here we talk about how God matters, or we believe people matter to God. That the one matters to us. We have these cards on, on the crosses, and, and it talks about who's the one. It's this, this belief, this conviction that there's probably at least one person in your life, in your sphere of influence, who needs to know about God's love and compassion. And so you can write their name on that card. If you don't have it, it's just a way to remember 
and, and you're encouraged to pray, love, and share. Pray for them. Love them. Like, genuinely love them. And if you can, in tangible ways, can you get groceries for them? Or can you make a meal if they need it? Can you help with yard work or watch their kids or their tangible ways? Or just get a cup of coffee and listen with them. Love them. And then share. Share your story. Share your home. Share your church. Share your story about Jesus. Pray, love, share. In the kingdom of God, it affirms the intrinsic worth of all people. Secondly, the kingdom of God confronts our biases. Now you say, I don't have, I don't have any biases or prejudices. I just want to say I, that's probably not true. All of us, our experiences and our, our group identities and all of this stuff, it, it comes, it's all shaped us. None of us are completely, purely objective about what we believe. All of us have had our beliefs to some degree built on our experiences and, and the people we've been in a relationship with and our upbringing and our parents and, and what's happened and all this stuff. And we've built some of our beliefs on our biases. And listen, this is normal and it can be innocent. I have a bias that chocolate is awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. But it can get bad, it can get ugly if that bias leads me to certain ideologies that are, are dangerous. So let's say I believe chocolate is awesome, and if you don't like chocolate, something is wrong with you. Actually, something is wrong with your taste buds, and we need to gather all the chocolate haters together and surgically do something to their taste buds to fix them. See, this ideology, based on this bias, can get out of hand really fast, and that's an innocent example, but it happens all the time, where we have these biases, but then we build ideologies about other people who don't agree with our bias. And I just, I'm going to dance. I've been dancing in negative territory probably the whole sermon, so I'm going to just keep, just gonna keep dancing there. I took a class in seminary about communication. It was an elective. And we looked at some documentaries about how propaganda works, and specifically in World War II. And one of the things that highlighted was the posters that were made during World War II to, to just sort of promote the American cause if it had a, an enemy soldier in it, like a German or a Japanese, there were little things they could do to the art to make them look more animalistic. Like maybe have their teeth a little more pointed or their eyes angry with their, their eyebrows really bushy to look animalistic because it's easier, it's easier to kill and hate another human being if you think they're an animal, if they look like a beast. And so the, that's how propaganda works. And I'm just going to tell you... Um, I don't, I don't care what your, you know, uh, selection would be, whether it's CNN or Fox. All of our news, they pump out propaganda. I've been one of them. And I'm not saying don't watch the news. I'm not saying be ignorant of what's happening. I just want to encourage you, uh, recognize what you're taking in. Recognize how they're painting the other, the other opponent. Notice the language they use. Notice what they try. Notice what it does to your heart and your soul. And recognize that you're being discipled by the news media you consume. It is shaping you. And I just want to encourage you, how is it shaping you? Is it shaping you to love your neighbor more like Jesus? Or is it shaping you to see them as the enemy? And then what is that doing to your heart? Because they're propaganda machines. <clears throat> That's lighthearted, right? The kingdom of God... The kingdom of God will confront our biases. And so the kingdom of God will confront biases. We have them about uh, Muslim people or Catholics or, or atheists. The kingdom of God will confront your biases about white people or black people or LGBTQ people or illegal immigrant people or homeless people or addicted people or incarcerated people. Notice the kingdom of God will confront the adjectives we put before people. Peter, if you see Roman soldier, if you see enemy before you see Cornelius, the person, you're going to miss the kingdom of God. Peter, if you see Gentile, if you see someone who deserves judgment, or you see someone who deserves death or whatever other violence, if you see that before you see people, you're going to miss the kingdom of God, Peter. You're going to go the way of Jonah and not the way of the kingdom. The kingdom of God will confront our biases if we see adjectives before we see people created in the image of God who he saw worth dying for. And then lastly, the kingdom of God is available to all people. God builds his church by expanding the availability of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is more about inclusion than exclusion, about inviting the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners to the table of grace with the Messiah. Now listen, 
some will reject the invitation. That is not our concern. Our, our job is to invite people to the table of grace, to, to announce, to bear witness. Jesus told a parable about the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, and he said, don't separate the wheat from the weeds. Don't try to separate it out. Just harvest it all. Let the judge, let God, let him do the separating. That's not for you to do. And so we're not going to, there will be people who re- will reject the invitation, but are we still we still invite, and we invite with generosity. Come join the celebration. Come join the table of grace. Come sit at the table with Rabbi Jesus. Come sit and, and know that there is hope for the hopeless. There is freedom for those who are in bondage. There is forgiveness for that past that you are so ashamed of. There is this God who is fundamentally good and merciful, and He loves you, and He wants you to experience His love and grace. Announce the invitation because the kingdom of God is available to all people. So we're not called to create a community that circles the wagons and and gathers in holy huddles and and defends our tribe against that tribe in the way the world does. We're called to be part of announcing this good news, this invitation. We're called to go to do the unthinkable and enter the home of Cornelius and tell him about Jesus. To tell them about this Jesus who loves them, who thought them worth dying for. So, I have a couple of reflection questions. <clears throat> Do you genuinely believe all people have intrinsic worth and value? Is it a core conviction? And then, does your conversation or social media posts about people, I, there's a typo on the screen, but about people you disagree with, does it reflect this core conviction? Why or why not? I want to suggest that God builds his church on a community of people who are just utterly convinced that people matter. I believe he builds his church on a community of people who see the intrinsic worth of all people. Do we believe that? Like, really? Like, do we really believe that? Number two, have you ever thoughtfully examined your biases and beliefs? Have you ever tried to step back and ask, why do I believe this? Why do I assume this? Especially if it's about other people. Like, why do I believe they, whoever they are? Why do I believe they think this? Why do I believe they have these moral convictions? Why do I believe these things about them? And then number three, who is one person in your life who you can pray for, love, and invite to belong or share your story with? Who's one person, so one person in your life who needs to know about the radical love of God? I, uh, I recognize that as I'm sharing this, that there's, there's probably something in some of you, just like there were with the, the Jews of Peter, but you're compromising truth. You'll compromise truth if you just have this gracious acceptance. I actually was talking to someone before service I'm reminded of the parable. One day I'll have to preach a, it's a great passage to preach a sermon about, but Jesus talks about uh, pulling the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a plank in your eye. You remember when Jesus talked about that? I think sometimes we focus on the size. A plank is bigger than a speck. And so it's talking about don't try to pick on people when you have bigger sin. And so then we get in this process of comparing bigger or little sin. But I think the point is actually when you have a plank in your eye, you're not able to see clearly. I think Jesus tries to tell us, you You don't have unbiased, perfect perspective of this person's story. You may not see it clearly. But the other thing is, taking a speck out of someone's eye assumes close proximity. I've had to take an eyelash out of my kid's eyes. To do that, you have to be really close. And you have to touch something really vulnerable. And there needs to be trust and love and relationship there. And so I am very committed to the truth. But I'm also very committed that I want there to be trust and relationship and love and proximity between me and other people before I attempt to pull what I see as a speck out of their eye. I want to love first and see their intrinsic value. 